Okay, so let's have a look at protocol independent multicast uh, as one way that multicast uh, is handled these days. So one of the, the key features of this uh, in the mode that it's usually used in sparse mode, because uh, again, what we talked about just before, might actually just be worth us going back to that slide. If we do this distance vector multicast, this is what's um, sometimes called dense mode where the multicast uh, traffic will basically try and get sent out to the entire internet and then the entire internet will try and prune it off so that it only needs to go where it needs to go. Uh, so that it only goes where it needs to go. Uh, so this doesn't scale particularly well as you can imagine. Uh, if you've got many multicast uh, groups being started up at any point in time, uh, you know, routers are going to spend a lot of bandwidth um, squelching that traffic. So instead, uh, PIM protocol independent multicast gives us a sparse mode option uh, where uh, clients basically have to ask to join or routers have to ask to join uh, multicast uh, uh, groups. And so this is done using uh, rendezvous points. This is RP uh, is the, uh, the rendezvous point. And so some client behind R4 will ask to join uh, some multicast group that's coming from, uh, you know, so R1 will have the source behind it, we'll say. So we send a join message um, and R5 uh, will also uh, send a join message. They will find their way up to the rendezvous point. Uh, and pardon me, uh, that will get forwarded down uh, to the original source router. Now it's possible that the different routers have different rendezvous points, or in fact, some of them may not have a rendezvous point. So router five here might actually just be directly uh, going to router one to ask to join the group. And the rendezvous points are often uh, high bandwidth routers uh, in the backbone, and that can either be manually configured, pardon me, or the, the router, a rendezvous point may be chosen using some uh, other protocol in there. So it kind of, there's a little bit of kicking the can down the road uh, in terms of the rendezvous point piece. Um, but in many cases, you know, again, for if you like, uh, you know, retail ISPs connecting to a wholesale backbone ISP, uh, the backbone ISP might simply say, I, I will be your rendezvous point for all multicast traffic to make things more efficient. So that will eventually uh, get back to the, um, uh, the source router, which will then know that there are nodes uh, out on these different paths to get there. So initially with the rendezvous point join, that will go up to the rendezvous point, uh, but the rendezvous point will be able to tell router three, no, 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 in fact, you've got a, a better path to uh, router four. And so the traffic won't flow through the rendezvous point. It really is just a rendezvous point. It's for coordination, uh, not for actually carrying the traffic. Uh, so that will head across. And then of course, uh, router five uh, joining, uh, you know, that will be added into the, um, the distribution tree by R2. So we end up with exactly the routers that need to be involved. The rendezvous point isn't playing an active role uh, in the, um, uh, the further carriage of the traffic. So again, if we have a look about how this works, um, so the host is uh, sending the traffic out um, to the group. Um, it gets to the first router. The first router says, well, actually we're sending it via a rendezvous point. So it has the rendezvous point uh, address uh, on there instead. Uh, that will head up uh, to the rendezvous point. Uh, and from there, uh, the rendezvous point will be stripped uh, from it and it will be delivered uh, directly. So this is how it will initially work. And then uh, router three will be able to learn from the rendezvous point that it actually needs to go to uh, to router two. Do we have, we don't actually show the, the diagram where that communication will happen from uh, RP back down to R3 to tell it that it can actually send it directly or indeed for that to come all the way back to uh, router one to say, actually, you don't need to send to me, you need to send uh, to router three and then onto router two. Uh, so router three here actually is the one that needs the updated information to know that it should be sending directly to router two. And so PIM uh, will organize that. Uh, so then related to this, we need to be able to discover uh, the source address uh, for a multicast uh, transmission so that the, uh, the paths can be set up. Um, so here we might have uh, the, so the, the first rendezvous point, 
uh, it will register the source uh, of the, the traffic. So SR is the source. will register with the nearest rendezvous point on the network. Uh, and then that rendezvous point will send a response back saying, yep, you've now joined the multicast group. So this is similar to the, the consumer doing this. Uh, and then that rendezvous point will tell the other rendezvous points that this is the source uh, for that traffic. And so again, that will come back to the, uh, the source router uh, and uh, inform that because of course the issue of the source will be behind the source router somewhere. Uh, and so in the end, then you'll end up with, again, the source specific tree to get the content going out. So to a rendezvous point one, of course it will go via that shorter path. To rendezvous point two, it now knows that it needs to also go to, uh, to that path uh, as well. Okay, so that's uh, PIM uh, and multicast. So now let's have a little bit of a look at uh, multi-protocol multi label switching. Uh, and so this was devised in the 90s to really be a, a bit of a, a hybrid between the datagram based switching uh, that the internet normally does and virtual circuits, which were quite common, uh, more common then than they are now. Uh, partly because again, the bandwidth and the routing speed wasn't as good uh, as it is now. And so virtual circuits still had some more natural advantages. Uh, and so for uh, the internet, really the kind of the the main benefits of that is you can do traffic engineering. So you can direct traffic over links that are less utilized uh, than, uh, than others uh, as a whole, right? So you can basically put a, a, a label switch, a switching label rather uh, on the traffic and have it all send over a particular direction. Um, the other thing that we can do is virtual private networks uh, where you're purposely creating a, a tunnel between two locations. So in effect, you're doing this via uh, routing rather than needing to do it through further encapsulation. Uh, and so this can also be used for, uh, for supporting mobility. And again, these are kind of related issues, right? Um, a mobile IP is a VPN where the endpoint moves, uh, if you want to think about it uh, in that regard. Uh, so this is supported by having a home agent. So if the, the mobile host uh, we'll have an IP address on the same network as the home agent. Uh, and then if a node wants, to, some other node wants to communicate with it, it will send packets to the home agent. Uh, and the home agent will need to know where to find the, um, uh, the node. So there'll be a foreign agent on the destination network where the node is connected, where it's registered that it's, uh, it's, it's sitting, even though its IP address doesn't sit in that network because it really belongs here. Uh, and the foreign agent will forward uh, the traffic on uh, to the mobile host. And of course, this foreign agent can change um, as the node moves around uh, to support the mobility. Uh, and so to make this work, so the home agent has to intercept the traffic that's meant for the mobile node. So it effectively does a proxy ARP. Uh, so it will respond to ARP requests for the, um, the mobile node so that the traffic on the local network will flow to the, um, uh, the home agent. Uh, and then the home agent uh, will forward the traffic on either using an IP tunnel um, or using a care of address uh, with a foreign agent uh, to deliver the, uh, uh, the traffic through. So again, it's just because the, the exterior address of the packet has to match what the internet is trying to route, uh, which is why you'll either use uh, an IP tunnel uh, so this is IP tunneled inside of IP, so the outside address will be uh, valid, um, or a care of address, which effectively is doing the same thing by saying, here is a packet addressed to the care of address and the care of uh, address, the node there, has to strip that envelope off the outside, decapsulate it and send it on to the, um, uh, the final destination. So there's a bunch of ways that uh, this can be done. Um, if you do it naively, you have this kind of triangle routing problem where you know, two nodes might actually be right next to each other. So the, you know, the, the home network, oops, the, uh, the home network for a node might be over, you know, over here somewhere and there's a sender who wants to send to it, but the node has actually moved <laughs> to be next to the sending node. So the sending node will be sending traffic all the way across the network and it comes all the way back again, when in fact it could just be sending it you know, directly. 
Um, so one solution to this is to let the sending node know the care of address, uh, and then it can create its own tunnel directly there. Uh, and so uh, that can be much more efficient. It requires that the senders have some support for mobility for this to work then efficiently. Uh, and we have to kind of manage this idea of a binding cache to say where these particular addresses uh, can be found uh, and to expire them as the node moves around. Because otherwise, you know, it's a bit like mail redirection. If you leave it on too long, your post ends up somewhere strange rather than uh, where you actually want it and need it. Okay, so we've had a bit of a, a look uh, at a bunch of these kind of uh, issues around scalability and in particular, uh, you know, it's measures that allow abstraction of the network structure uh, based on where the consumers and producers of traffic. So multicast does this uh, to, in some ways. Uh, mobile, you know, IP mobility does this in other ways. Uh, and so this then becomes much more important. Again, we, we think about the kind of, you know, the uh, cloud services, you know, online video conferencing kind of things or uh, online distributed file storage, uh, messaging, uh, the like. You know, all of these things tend to be running in cloud services rather than actually in, uh, you know, dedicated physical data centers because it's cheaper to do, right? And much more adaptable and flexible. Uh, and so, you know, having these efficient ways to deal with traffic being produced and consumed in different and somewhat arbitrary places around the internet uh, become much more uh, important. So we have multicast, we have traffic engineering, IP mobility, um, these have become key enablers for cloud services. And so the cloud service providers basically absorb these into their offerings so that they can be provided transparently uh, to the users, you know, to their clients, their customers uh, who obtain their services. Okay, so again, stepping one step further back. So, you know, we've talked a bit about these different kind of scalability issues around the internet. Um, and IPv6 that was kind of brought in as a potential solution to that. Uh, and there's still, you know, 25 years later plus uh, is really still not seeing tremendously high adoption rates, uh, perhaps because it tried to solve too many things, uh, perhaps because NAT relieved the initial pressure uh, that led to its uh, creation. We've talked a little bit about uh, multi-protocol uh, label switching uh, and mobility and, and these sorts of things to, again, get this idea of really a, a modern dynamic uh, internet that has grown to do much more than what the internet originally was envisaged uh, to do and at a much higher scale. And this is what enables these services that we, you know, we all now come to know, enjoy, and in, in many cases to rely upon. So that's it for this chapter and we'll see you back for chapter five.